it is a pleasure and honor to be speaking in front of you, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Today, my topic is Ummah, one body. And I want to begin by going back to the very roots of both the challenges and opportunities that our distinguished speakers have talked about. The challenge and opportunity of being the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The title of my talk that was chosen by Ikna very aptly is Ummah One Body. Do you know where that title comes from? It comes from a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, a saying of the Prophet that says مثل المؤمنين في توعدهم وتراحمهم وتعاطفهم كمثل الجسد الواحد that the example of the believers in their mutual love and mercy and emotions is like one body. When one part of the body hurts, the rest of the body responds by staying up, by feeling the pain, by doing something to fix the pain and the hurt or the wound of one of its parts. This is a metaphor, an example that the Prophet has given us and the reason is that he knew he knew how great and the numbers of the Ummah is going, are going to be. His Ummah is going to be great and it's difficult sometimes for us to visualize what are we talking about when we think of the Ummah of Muhammad Who are we talking about? They aren't people who want, speak one language. They don't look like, uh, you know, one complexion, one color, one set of features. And they sometimes disagree passionately about what to do, what is right, what, what did the Prophet ﷺ want. <clears throat> So the Prophet ﷺ provided us a metaphor, an example that we could keep in mind when we are thinking about the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ. Similarly, I'll give you another metaphor, another example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides in the Quran. A metaphor is something simple and easy that you witness, that you see to understand something that is more complex and hard to see. It's hard to understand the Ummah, but it's easy to understand how one body is connected and you cannot succeed. One hand cannot succeed, cannot be happy, cannot feel prosperous without the entire body being in harmony with it. There is no such thing as the success of one part of your body. So when the Prophet uses that metaphor, it is the Prophet wasallam telling us that you will not be prosperous if you cut up yourselves into different groups and ethnicities and races and classes and nations 
and then try to be happy at the expense, some at the expense of others. That is impossible. That is what this metaphor is telling us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran tells us, uses another metaphor, and the metaphor is ikhwa, that the believers are brothers. <clears throat> so this other metaphor, an example of brotherhood and sisterhood. Now we're extremely, uh, we're used to hearing brothers and sisters, right? You see in the example of the companions, as they would come to the Prophet ﷺ and become Muslim, they would consider other Muslims who came from different tribes as their true brothers and sisters. And their true brothers and sisters, if they had not joined Islam, they would consider them outsiders, foreigners. But I want you to think deeper about this metaphor. The metaphor of brothers and sisters actually means that there is going to be conflict. If you have ever been a brother and sister or have children like I do, my children deeply love each other, they look like each other, they're constantly in each other's business, but they're also constantly fighting. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ That the believers are brothers and sisters, so make peace between them. This means that what Allah is telling us through this metaphor, is that being brothers and sisters does not mean that you're always going to agree. It means that peacemaking is going to be an active need, an active job that all of us must do. And we must expect that there are going to be conflicts in the ummah. There are going to be disagreements. So when we sign up being the ummah, being the community of the Prophet, these two things come immediately with that deal. The two testimonies, when we say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, these two things come with it. One, you will not prosper alone. It is not possible for the rich in the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to prosper and there are some people that are left out as poor. For the people of one ethnicity, the Arabs to prosper, but African Americans, no, they can be left out. South Asians to be okay, but white Americans, poor, no, or the other way around. That will not happen. As soon as you become part of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your destinies become connected like the destiny and the feelings of one body. And second, just as brothers and sisters disagree with each other, and in fact, they learn about the world and they grow together by disagreeing, sometimes play fighting, sometimes really annoying each other. But it is in that process that they learn to be successful human beings in the world. Just like that, there are going to be conflicts in the ummah. But there, a question arises. Isn't it hard 
to care about so many people and be heard about the persecution of the Uyghur in eastern Turkestan, we heard about Palestine, we heard about our brothers and sisters in India, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. But in fact, it's not a burden, it's an honor and an opportunity. You see, what it means to become an ummah is that you are no longer a frog in a well that sees its interests just by looking at its own needs. Think of yourself not as a frog that sees that world whose world is limited by a small well, but an eagle that travels thousands and thousands of miles over the course of its life and sees the whole picture. In the same way, the Ummah of Muhammad, when we learn that each one of us, no matter where you are born, you are connected to Muslims in China, Muslims in India, Muslims in Pakistan, in Kashmir, Muslims in Detroit, Muslims in California, you are no longer a little frog in a well, you are that eagle. And, you know, it is... Uh, people say that if you are a parent, you cannot be happier than the least happy of your child. Meaning, Having children is complicated, and you're always worried about the squeaky wheel. But that's only half the truth, and not the interesting part of the truth. The truth is that when you become a parent, your world expands so that you experience the world and the happiness and the complexities and the richness of life through each one of your children. In the same way, when you understand that you're a part of a global ummah, you have the opportunity now to experience the world, its richness, through hundreds of these different ethnicities and people all around the world who are joined by these two testimonies. I will finally end with another story that the Quran teaches and this is a story that appears as a great warning. Allah addresses the Israelites, the Banu Israel, and Allah took a pledge from them saying that you shall not kill each other and you shall not drive each other out of your houses. You will be like one people. You will be brothers and sisters. You will be an ummah. <clears throat> this was a mandate that was given to them and then, in Surah Al-Baqarah, <clears throat> verse 85, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَنْتُمْ هَاُولَاءِ تَقْتُلُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَتُخْرِجُونَ فَرِيقًا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ تَظَاهَرُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِالْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ وَإِنْ يَاتُوكُمْ أُسَارَةُ فَادُوهُمْ وَهُوَ مُحَرَّمٌ عَلَيْكُمْ إِخْرَاجُهُمْ أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْض فما جزاء من يفعل ذلك منكم إلا خزي في الحياة الدنيا ويوم القيامة يردون إلى شد العذاب وما الله بغافل عما تعملون. This is one of the strongest warnings that Allah subhanahu wa taala has given 
in the Quran to any community, to any people. The story begins when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes this pledge that you are one ummah. The Israelites are the Muslims, the believers of their time. They are the community of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. But here is the interesting thing. They began to split up into different tribes or into different nations and fought each other. So when it came to making alliances with others in their interest against their brothers, when it came to politics, they went ahead for their secular interests. They split up based on their needs. But then, when some of them, some of the Israelites or the Jews, would be captured and punished and taken as slaves and captives, then they would practice personal piety, Allah says, by giving charity and freeing those captives or giving them food. Why? Because they're Jews like us. So when it came to a political virtue, when it came to solidarity, when it came to standing with each other as an ummah, they failed. But when it came to personal piety and zakat and alms and sadaqah, charity, they were all over it. Does that remind you of someone? Is there an ummah like that? today that makes alliances against each other that turns against each other when it comes to real life but when it comes to talking about charity and piety yes we are all over it this exactly was the sin for which Allah says do you believe in part of the book and reject the other part? This was their sin. They thought, oh, solidarity, that's politics. Being one ummah, that's politics. We will just do personal charity and give our zakat and charity. Personal piety and purification and tazkiyah and tasawwuf, we're all over it. But when it comes to what my politics is going to be, how I'm going to set up my real solidarity, who I'm going to be first and foremost, that, that was whatever my interests were. And Allah says in punishment that what would be a punishment? What is a punishment other than خِزْيُونْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Humiliation in this world وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ أَشَدِّ الْعَذَابِ And in the day of judgment they will be turned they will return to a worse punishment This was for us a warning a prophecy And this is the essence of we, what we must avoid. To be an ummah means to be concerned, to be in solidarity in all affairs, in all things, not just when it's convenient. And so finally, I'll wrap up by saying that what we need to do in order to respond to all the challenges that we have heard about is we need to revive the sunnah, 
revive the prophetic guidance and the Quranic imperative of being an ummah. We need to create space in our minds and our hearts for being ummatic. We are first and foremost the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That is our identity. And that space needs to be in our minds in a, and in our hearts. What does that mean? That means you cannot be ummatic, you cannot think about Palestinians or help them or about Indian Muslims or Uyghur Muslims if you don't know about them. And you have to feel, you have to be able to communicate to them. And you have to take the trouble to expand your mind to understand their history. And the same goes for all of these different parts of the Ummah. But your heart has to feel the love and the pain and the richness. In the end then, I call for these few things to open up the space in our mind, a new box, a new window. When you think of yourself, think of yourself as I belong to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyone, anywhere in the world who says the two testimonies, who says La Ilaha Illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, becomes my concern my strength, my brother and my sister. Do not think of this as a burden, but think of it as an honor. Think of this as an opportunity to, to live your life in the most complete, rich sense here and meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that we have the richness of this entire ummah in our favor, in our balance, not against us. Because it makes us richer and deeper and sadder and happier as human beings. But it also must make us motivated. And you may specialize for one cause. But all of those, anyone who is working for any of those becomes part of your problem. Even if you cannot do anything about them, someone is, has a task force on Uyghur, you pray for them, you help them. But find a cause, be umatic. And I'll end with this optimistic note that despite all the challenges that we see today, the Ummah of the Prophet wasallam is growing and I'll point to two facts. Hundred years ago, Muslims made something like 10% of the world population, 10 to 12%. Today, Muslims are 25% of the world's population. Despite all the colonialism and all the genocide, all the attacks and wars, Muslims today are 25% of the world's population and growing. Number two, not in recent memory can we find in Islamic history so many different Muslims talking to each other, learning from each other, marrying each other, worrying about each other as we see today. And that is a great place to start. The Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ is waking up. 
it's rising and our time our time the time for the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam inshallah is here again make sure that each one of you does your part thank you very much assalamu alaikum